Hi. Hi. Good evening. You're not seeing things. It is me. <laughs> I hope everybody is well. I am going to be standing in for the rabbi this evening. I'm just going to um, Oh, we are. We're up on Facebook. Okay. All right. So we're going to be starting a new safer, a new book this week. The book of um, of Shemos. Last week we was Chazak. We finished the um, we finished the Sefer Bereshis, and um, and this week we're starting the new Sefer, the new book of Shemos. And um, in this week's Parsha in this week's portion, we go to a new a new era in our history, in the Jewish history, the Jewish people, as um, if you remember from the end of the book of Bereshis, the children of Yaakov, the Bnei Yisrael find themselves in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, and, um, and the slavery begins. And as the slavery begins and the oppression of the Jewish people becomes more intense, so Hashem, so God blesses the Jewish people and they begin to produce many, many children. And, um, and we are introduced to some very holy and special characters from the Torah, namely Shifra and Pua, who are the um, who are the midwives, the Jewish midwives, otherwise known as Miriam and Yochebed, the mother and the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu of Moses, and it's in this week's portion that we see that Pharaoh decrees all the Jewish babies be all the boys be thrown into the Nile and um, and as this oppression and as this slavery becomes darker and darker this is the the atmosphere into which the leader Moshe Rabbeinu Moses who ultimately takes us out of Egypt and brings us to receive the Torah is is born and um and we know if we look into the parsha this week we see that moshe has many trials and tribulations and ultimately has to leave egypt so on the one hand he grows up in the king's palace but he also has to um he has to run away and he becomes Rabbi book it. <laughs> you are mute. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, the rabbi came to put in an appearance to say hello. Hi Welcome from, uh, from uh, Cancun, Mexico. I'm sure my wife's going to do a good job. Oh, rabbi. Okay, I'll, I'll leave. See you. I won't bother you. Actually, my husband is uh, at my wedding, Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow. So um, that's where he is right now. So as, this, as the parsha continues with the narration this week, um, and Moshe Rabbeinu Moses ends up in Midian and he becomes a shepherd to his father-in-law's flock 
And as he is running after one of the sheep, he encounters the famous burning bush. And from this bush, Hashem, God speaks. God speaks to Moses and he tells him that uh, he is hearing the cries of the Jewish people in Egypt who are really under such great duress and hardships and difficulties. And um, he tells Moshe Rabbeinu, tells Moses that he wants him to go to Egypt and speak to King Pharaoh and tell the king to let the Jewish people go. You know, it's interesting because everybody knows the refrain, let my people go. Many people are not aware that in Hebrew, there's another word that comes after let my people go. And that is vaya abduni, so that they might serve me. And this is really a very, very important word that um, the reason we were taken out of Egypt as a nation was so that we might serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we might serve Hashem. And um, and so this is the this is the setting of the the situation that the Bnei Yisrael that the Jewish people are experiencing in this week's parsha and this week's portion. Today we're going to look at a beautiful sicha, a beautiful discourse from the Lubavitcher Rebbe on this week's portion. And um, and what we're going to be discussing, we're going to be looking at is um, a, a comparison, a contrast between two very great leaders that we really all are somewhat familiar with. And they are Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, and Elijah, the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. And, um, and, and we're going to be looking at these two personalities and what they represent and what it means to us in our service to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and in our purpose in this world. And you have, on the one hand, you have Moshe Rabbeinu, who uh, represents the one with flaws, with difficulties, turbulent and you have on the other hand Elijah Eliyahu Hanavi who represents the concept of perfectionism and the question really is um, is is being perfect the ideal you know to 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 be a perfectionist is not really a very comfortable um thing because when one is constantly striving for perfectionism in an imperfect world so there is always a feeling of not having arrived not having been able to reach that level of of perfection tell the joke of a perfectionist that walks into a bar and he says to the bartender, leave, I'll make the drink myself. So I think even if we are not a perfectionist, I think that all of us can relate to this concept because there's always something in our life or some part of our life that we wish would be perfect and that we strive for perfection in, whether it's for, from ourselves or perhaps from somebody else. And, um, and, and as we're going to look at this discourse from the Rebbe, we're going to understand the difference between these two leaders, Moshe Rabbeinu and Elijah the prophet and how it pertains to us in our individual lives. So Elijah 
is 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 a prophet that is one of the better known prophets um very famous for appearing in our lives at so many important moments um we know that uh, when we talk about the concept of mashiach we say uh we we relate Eliyahu Anabi as Elijah is the one that is going to herald in the era of Mashiach. At every Seder, we wait for the arrival of Mashiach, right? I'm sure everybody can think back to their younger days when they were part of a Seder looking for the wine to go down in the, in the cup as Elijah is invited into the home and the door is open for Eliyahu Anabi. Um, at a bris, we have the kisei shal Eliyahu Anavi. We have the chair of Elijah the prophet. And Elijah is also mentioned on a weekly basis, every Shabbos. When Shabbos goes out, we make mention also of Elijah the prophet. Now, during the lifetime of Eliyahu Anavi, of Elijah the prophet, there was a very famous uh, confrontation that Elijah had with the prophets of the idolatry of the time, the idolatry of Baal. And, um, and we're going to look in text number one, which is from Malachim, from the book of Kings. And we're going to see in this text how Eliyahu Navi Elijah, expresses this search for perfectionism, that being in the middle is just not good enough. And, um, and, and he is standing against hundreds who are on the other side of the fence. So let's look at this text text number one on page three and elijah drew near to all the people and said until when are you hopping between two ideas if the lord is god go after him and if the baal then go after him and the people didn't answer him a word and elijah spoke to the people I have remained a prophet to God by myself, and the prophets of the Baal are 450 men. So here is this lone prophet standing up against hundreds of others. And it's really very important what he's saying. Elijah is saying, you can't be on both sides of the fence. You've got to pick one. Either you're for Baal or you are for Hashem or you are for God. And um, after Elijah was victorious over Baal, actually que the queen at that time, Queen Isabel, Isabel, wanted to have Eliyahu Anabi killed. And he fled and he eventually came to Mount Chorev, which is another name for Sinai. And there he had a vision. He had a prophetic vision. In it, he complained to Hashem about the sins of the Jewish people. And, um, and, and he, was, he was lamenting about how the Jews were sinning and they were worshiping idols and how he, in his search, and in his quest to bring godliness to the people is now a wanted man. And, um, and he came to the point where he felt that he just had no place in this world. And he was actually suicidal. And if you look at text number two, also in the book of Kings, chapter 19, Kings 1, chapter 19, verse 10. And he said, I've been zealous for the Lord the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have killed your prophets by the sword. And I have remained alone and they seek 
my life to take it. So we see on the one hand that um, Elijah had such a perfect relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, such a perfect relationship with Hashem. On the other hand, we see he gets driven to this point of, of, of feeling suicidal. But the truth is, even though we, we are presented here with two very altogether different views of Eliyahu, both of them come from the same drive. And that is an absolute wholehearted commitment to Hashem. So when he sees, when he sees the Jewish people are sinning and they're uh, and they are running after idols he has no option because he is wholly given over to to his relationship and the jewish people's relationship with god so he has no option other than to lash out at the jewish people and to do his best to bring them back to their faith and even though he did this he wasn't totally successful. Um, and, and it was really because of this um, lashing out at the Jewish people and talking negatively to Hashem about the Jewish people, that is, it, that is how it came to be that Elijah to this day is present at every Seder and at every bris. This is so to say his um, his teshuva that he comes and he sees despite what he said that Bnei Yisrael, the Jewish people, even though we may take a little uh, a, 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 a little walk down an, a, a, an alley that wasn't part of the map, but yet we still are here, we still are um, having brismila, we still are having sadorim. We have never forgotten our relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So, so Eli, Eliyahu Elijah represents this picture of perfectionism, and that's why Elijah is connected. We'll talk more about this later with the with the coming of Mashiach, which we are striving towards that era of perfectionism. Um, we know that when Mashiach is going to come, the prophet uh, tells us that Hashem is going to send Elijah the prophet. Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of God. And it makes sense that this would be the prophet the prophet of perfectionism to usher in this uh, era of perfection, the era of Mashiach, the era when the entire world will recognize the presence of Hashem and will pray to Hashem and will thank Hashem and will serve Hashem. Now let's look at Moshe Rabbeinu, at Moses. Moses represents not the concept of perfection. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, represents the work in progress. We call ourselves human beings. I heard somebody talking, I think it was actually my husband, <laughs> Um, and saying we're, we're not human beings, we're human becomings, that we are a work in progress. If you look at the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, Mo Moses, and we see this in his life, that um, he grew up alone in the king's palace, the only Jew living in the in the king's palace after the king's daughter saved him from the water. Then he had to run away to Midian 
and um, he was again a stranger, different to everybody in Midian. And uh, and that's when he was looking after his father-in-law's sheep that he comes and he has this encounter with Akkadosh Baruch Hu, with God. So he's already seen how the Jewish people have lived in Egypt. And it was actually the wicked king who wanted to kill him that forced him to run away to Midian. And, um, and now Hashem says to him, you, you've got to take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt. And it's very interesting that as God is talking to Moshe Rabbeinu, what he says to Hashem, his response to Hashem is, if you look at uh, on page five, text number four, as Hashem is talking to Moshe Rabbeinu, okay, get this picture. He sees this bush. It's on fire. It's not being consumed. He walks over to see what's going on. And Hashem is telling him, yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hearing the Jewish people and I want you to go and, uh, and you're going to bring the, the, the Jews out of Egypt. Moses' response is, Hashem no biyad tishlach. But he said, I beseech you, O God, send now with whom you would send, meaning send the message the message of let the Jewish people go, send it with whom you will send. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu is presenting his case that he does not feel worthy. He doesn't feel that he is the right candidate for the job. So he says, send now with whom you will send. So who is he referring to? Who is this other person that Moshe Rabbeinu feels is more worthy, is more apropos for this job? So let's look at the Medrash. In text number five, the Medrash tells us that Moses said to God, send now your message with whom you would send, namely with the person you're planning on sending in the future. God responded, I didn't say go and deliver the message to the Jewish people, rather go and deliver the message to Pharaoh. As for the person of whom you speak, I indeed plan on sending him in the future to the Jewish people, as the verse states, we quoted this earlier, lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of God. So that's who Moshe Rabbeinu was referring to when he says to God, there is another fella. He's much better fit. He's a better fit for this job. Why don't you send him? Okay, so we have some questions. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu was very humble. We understand that he was very humble and he would shun the spotlight and would right away say that he doesn't want to do this. Um, and we know that humility is a hallmark of a great leader. We know that. But why the question really is not so much why did Moshe Rabbeinu feel that, so, that somebody else could do the job, but why specifically Eliyahu Hanavi? Why was Eliyahu Hanavi the guy and Moshe Rabbeinu was saying, I'm not the guy? Why was Moshe Rabbeinu suited for the job, which must be the case since Hashem asked him to? And Eliyahu Anavi not necessarily was suited for this job. So we're going to we we're, we're going to the Rebbe is going to take us on this journey and help us understand both of these concepts. Why Hashem chose Moshe Rabbeinu for this job at this time, and why he felt he wasn't fit for the job, and why Eliyahu Anavi was not fit for 
this job at this time? So in order to answer the question, we're going to take a step back for a moment and we're going to look at world history a little bit. It's not a history lesson, don't worry. We only uh, have a, a limited time for this class. So uh, we're just going to look at the way history is interpreted, history is looked at, history is ultimately experienced. Um, and through this, we'll be able to understand these two um, concepts through of these two great leaders, each what which they represent and how they um how they impact us and what it means to us now many people um look at history in different ways and we the jewish people have our own very specific way as the torah shows us to look at history um there's a very popular book called The Gifts of the Jews by Thomas Cahill. And he speaks a lot about this view of history, linear versus cyclical. Um, many people and most people from earlier times view history not as a, a, a linear view of history, but rather that time progresses as a cycle. And in other words, what has been is going to be again. And, um, and Thomas Cahill in his book, he says the Jews were the first people to find a new way of thinking and experiencing a new way of understanding and feeling the world so much so that it may, may be said with some justice that theirs is the only new idea that human beings have ever had. And, um, and so according to Cahill, we, the Jewish people, were the first to view time in more of a linear fashion, right? Our Torah starts with the word voracious in the beginning. So there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there is an end, right? So right away, we can see this concept, this idea, beginning, middle, end. The beginning impacts the middle, impacts the end. Um, and this is really a very important way of viewing life, of viewing our history, because it impacts our very way of living our own lives. Um, and, and that is that we, what we do today matters to tomorrow. What our ancestors did yesterday matters to us today and so on from the beginning voracious from the beginning and ultimately we're on this journey to perfection we might say to the era of mashiach and each generation builds on the generation before and we this is what we're going to be looking at and, um, and, and the truth is, if you look in the physical world, we can see this. We can see how humanity has progressed in terms of discoveries, inventions. Um, you know, if we take the time to look at the world around us and try and view the modern world through the eyes of somebody that lived in earlier times, it's incredible. It's, it's unbelievable, but we didn't get here by ourselves. 
we didn't create the wheel. We didn't, we, we didn't discover how to make roads. We have built on from the previous generations. And here we are today. If we can say this and see this in the physical world, in the material world, the same is true in the spiritual world. In the journey that we all are living and trying to get back to that state of godly perfection in this world. So let's have a look at, at the Midrash rubber in text number six. Rabbi Yehuda ben Shimon said, the world was created perfect and whole. So Hashem created this magnificent world, perfect and whole, and then what? Then Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, it was a very short amount of time that they existed in this world and they sinned, they ate from the tree of knowledge. And this is something that has tainted the world until today. We still are working towards getting back to that, uh, to that time. But we do know that, uh, that the generations after them did manage to, to do some damage control and bring the goodness back into the world. It took a while. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of evil that took place. And then we came to the era of the giving of the Torah. And then the Torah, the giving of the Torah was such an incredible event. And once again, the world was in this in, in, in sublimely entrenched and 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 soaked in goodness and light and godliness and then a short while later the jewish people worshiped the golden calf so it seems like there's this pattern of it's amazing it's great it's perfect it's beautiful and then we take steps back then again it's amazing it's wonderful it's beautiful, and we take steps back. And, 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 and again, we said there's two ways of looking at this. We can look at this in a way where, okay, so it's great and it's wonderful, and, 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 and the circle of time goes around, and eventually we'll get back to where we started. Or, as we have said, and the Torah shows us, we can look at things in a linear way. So let's see what the Zohar says. Text number seven. When the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, they were scrubbed of the snake's stain. Okay, so at Har Sinai, that stain that came about through the sin that the snake was the uh, catalyst of that sin, it was scrubbed clean. They were exposed to incredible visions of spiritual light and their eyes were opened in a way that the stain of the snake could not contaminate them, rendering them immune to history's earlier filth. But when they sinned with the golden calf, all the spiritual light left them and they were recontaminated with the snake's bite as earlier, bringing death to the entire world. So the Zohar here makes it very clear that there is this ping pong of becoming 
entrenched in light and holiness and goodness, and then going back to filth and, and, and darkness and evil. So if we're seeing this ping pong, this back and forth, as we go through our history, where do we see the progress? Was the accomplishment at Har Sinai just to go back to what was in Ganadin, in the Garden of Eden? And did the sin of the golden calf take us back to how it was after the sin of the snake, after the eating of the, of, of the tree of, of knowledge? And, and we can go forward with this question then. Is the event, the era of Mashiach, bringing us back to what was at the giving of the Torah, at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai? And I, I think you've probably all guessed that the answer is no, that it, that's not the case, um, we have a very important rule in Yiddishkeit and being in a Chabad house, you've probably heard this many times. If you haven't, you will hear it many times. And that is the concept of Yerida Lutzorech Aliyah, that there is a, a descent for the sake of an ascent. If you think about somebody on a diving board, right? So they get that spring going up and down and up and down. And the descent that the downward part is for what? Is so that ultimately when they come up, they can go higher even than they were to start with. And then even to greater heights as they propel themselves off of the diving board. That's the concept of your reader, there is a descent for the sake of, a, of an ascent. And this is a very important concept in Yiddishkeit. And we'll see the Rebbe in, the, in this discourse. If you look at text number eight, in this discourse that the Rebbe gives, he says as follows, the notion that every low leads to an even greater high is well known. It states that the entire purpose of falling off the previous level is for the heights that can be achieved thereby. It follows that the heights reached after the fall are greater even relative to the perch one was at, to the perch one was at prior to the fall. It follows that the level reached after Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, that in turn came after the sin with the tree of knowledge is greater even than the perch at which the world stood prior to the sin with the tree of knowledge. The same is true with the heights that we will reach with the future redemption. And that comes after the sin of the golden calf relative to the perch at which the world stood at Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah prior to the sin of the golden calf. So while it seems that our history and the world's history seems to be this ping pong effect, taking a step back, coming a step forward, it is not the case. Rather, we are living spirally. Each event that takes place, each time that we have fallen and then come up from that fallen state, we rise to an even higher level than before the, than before the sin. So how does that translate in history? That translates that after the golden calf, the Jewish people were on a higher level than Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden 
before the sin and at the coming of Mashiach, we will be on a, an even higher level than the Jewish people, than we were standing at Har Sinai before the sin of the golden calf. And um, we see it was actually at Har Sinai, at Matan Torah, that we received the ability, the strength to be able to move forward and to come ultimately, eventually, to this state of greatness and perfection in the era of Mashiach. It should be speedily in our days. This strength was given to us at Har Sinai. So before the giving of the Torah, we had a relationship with God. After the Torah was given, it was altogether a very different relationship. And while the relationship did take a beating, when we did the sin of the golden calf, nevertheless, that sin did not succeed in taking us back to first base. The, the power of the giving of the Torah on the relationship between Hashem and Bnei Yisrael was so great that even the sin of the golden calf could not vanquish that relationship. Yes. It did take us to a place where we had a lot of repairing in the relationship to do, but, um, but we still remained with that ability to enjoy the relationship, which, will, which we will enjoy in the future with the coming of Mashiach. And just to uh, explain this a little bit, imagine that there's a very great person, um, someone who is very, very unusual, has an incredible mind, an incredible soul, and that person wants to make friends with you. And when that friendship forms, two things happen. First is that the, that great and incredible person who up until the point of this friendship remained aloof remains someone who was not close but now we have been shown part of who they are they have opened themselves up they've revealed themselves to us and therefore we have a better understanding of who they are what their character is and so on and in addition when that great person calls you or me, their friend. So now we have been elevated by this friendship. So two things are happening. This great person is revealing themselves, coming down to become closer to me or to you. And you or I are being elevated by the status of this friendship with the, uh, the great mind and soul of this person. And so, um, and this is what happened at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, that Hashem revealed more of himself to us and we in turn became more spiritually elevated. That is what happened at Har Sinai. So now we're talking about a whole new era, a whole different story. Um, so this relationship goes both ways, that we go higher and closer to Hashem, and Hashem reveals more of himself to us. And this is what Hashem said to us. When he gave us the Torah, he said, I want to be your friend. I want to be close 
to you. So first, Hashem started to engage more with this world, to reveal himself more with this world. And second, the world now felt worthy of elevating itself and becoming closer to Hashem. When Hashem gave the Torah this elevated status that we achieved and that we responded to was a permanent elevation. And no sin, no matter how great as we see, and the, and the sin of the golden calf idolatry was indeed a very great sin, but it was not a sin, nothing big enough that would be able to take away that elevated status that would allow us to repair the damage that had been done to our, uh, to, to Hashem, to, sorry, to the world, really. You can't say we do damage to Hashem, but it still gives us, we still have this ability to fix the relationship and not only to fix the relationship, but ultimately to grow from this experience. And the Rebbe continues in text number nine, even though the sin of the golden calf recontaminated the Jewish people, it still was not at the same level of contamination as before Matan Torah. This is because the plateau to which the Jews arrived when the contamination was scrubbed by Matan Torah was higher than where the world stood prior to the sin of the tree of knowledge. Let that sink in for a moment. Imagine the world in its pristine state before mankind had done any sin in the, in the Garden of Eden. At Har Sinai, we were on an, an even higher level than that. In other words, the impact of Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, was closer to home and with greater saturation and so even when the Jews thereafter fell, the residual impact was still felt. So imagine if our, if our relationship with Hashem was so deeply impacted by this event in our history, Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, how much more so is it going to be at the revelation at the time of Mashiach, at the redemption? But don't forget, we're still making this happen. We're still on this journey. We did have the sin of the golden calf. We did have the destruction of one temple and a second temple. We did worship the Baal and so on and so forth. But we continue. The Yerida was Letzarech Aliyah, was the descent, was for the sake of an ascent so that ultimately we will arrive at a level of a relationship with Hashem that will be far superior to what it was in Gan Eden at the beginning of time, far superior to what it was at the giving of the Torah. And the Rebbe explains that according to Hasidus, the reason that our relationship with Hashem wasn't able to, because if you think about it, right, we said it, we, we were on such a high level. How come we did this great sin? How could we have worshipped the golden calf? And in the Hasidus, it's explained that the reason that we came to this point was that the revelation at Sinai was indeed immense. It was huge. It was tremendous. It was so powerful that ultimately it overwhelmed the world and it overwhelmed the Jewish people. 
rather than transforming the world and transforming the Jewish people. And that's why we came to sin. The Midrash speaks about this type of overwhelmingly stifling level of revelation. If you look at text number 10, the Midrash tells us, says, Rabbi Abahu in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, when the Holy One gave the Torah, no bird screeched, no fowl flew, no ox mooed, none of the Ophanim, the angels flapped a wing, nor did the Seraphim, the burning celestial beings, chant Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. The sea didn't roar, and none of the creatures uttered a sound throughout the entire world. There was only a deafening silence as the divine voice went forth speaking, I am the Lord, your God. The silence that the Medrash describes over here represents the world being subsumed in the reality that everything is energized by Hashem and at its core is Hashem, that everything in this world is the spark of godliness that is within it. But even though this was a great leap forward, it was still something that had limitations. If you imagine that you're trying to convince some, someone about something, and I'm sure everybody has on the tip of their tongues so many things right now that they can think that they want to be able to convince someone of. And, um, and you come up with the most amazing statistic, you pull it right out of the hat, that the other person is totally gobsmacked. They cannot respond, they have nothing to say. So in that moment, so to speak, you've won the argument, you've presented your case. But really what's happened is that in that moment, you have temporarily silenced the other person. You haven't actually turned them around. On the other hand, if you were to be very calculated and very patient and slowly, slowly, slowly bring out the explanation that you have and that you believe so strongly in, that's a much better way of bringing the person around to be able to change their way of thinking. I actually, I, I often give the example of a sponge. If you take a sponge when it's very dry, if you want the, if you want water to be absorbed into the sponge, what you need to do is you need to take a dropper and take a tiny little bit of water at a time and slowly, slowly the sponge will soften up and will be able to take in more water. This is what happened at Har Sinai, as, is, as, as was explained in the Midrash over here. It was such a shocking situation, but we didn't absorb the concept, and the world didn't absorb this light and this holiness. Surely the light had an impact, for sure, there's no question about it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, a very short while later, we did come to worship the golden calf. And um, and 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 it's it, it it's it, the impact though was so great and so immense, and that impact never left us. It's always a part of us, which is why we will 
emits Hashem very, very soon arrive from Bereshis to the middle and ultimately to the end, to the era of Mashiach, not through perfectionism, but building upon those who were there before us, building on our own deeds that we did yesterday. So yesterday we did a little more and today we add to that and tomorrow we add to that and ultimately at the end of days meaning at the end of days as we know them now days of darkness and days of concealment we will see the reparation that we have done not only that we have repaired but that it is superior to even that great level at har sinai at mutton torah as it says, the Zechariah, the prophet says, text 11, and it shall come to pass on that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the earth and they shall no longer be mentioned. And also the prophets and the spirit of evil, I will remove from the earth. And the, the Rebbe Rashab, Rav Shalom Dovbeck, he explains this idea um, comparing the time after Matan Torah, talking about, you know, not, not having been transformed, the Rebbe, Rashab, compares it to what the Alter Rebbe explains in the Tanya, in the book of Tanya, about the Benani, the person who still has evil within them and hasn't quite changed it. So if we look at text number 12, we'll see what the Rebbe Rashab says. He says, while there was an intense godly revelation at Matan Torah, at the giving of the Torah, the world remained entrenched in its place, unrefined as it was prior. How can we say this when the Talmud states that the world was scrubbed from its contamination? we could suggest in similar fashion to what is explained in Tanya about the Bainani, namely that his negative urges are asleep, but always ready to be able to be awakened. So it is here. After Matan Torah, the Jews sinned with the golden calf and were recontaminated, right? Because it didn't transform it. It shut it up, but it didn't transform it. This is because they were never entirely refined. In the future redemption, by contrast, the world will be completely transformed, vaulted to a lofty perch, right? Your reader, let's we're going down. I should say we went down. In order to go up into a vehicle for the highest level of godliness and this is what we have to look forward to not only to coming back to what they had at sinai but to be on an even greater and higher level and these two concepts these ideas are very very closely associated with these two tzaddikim these two holy people Moshe Rabbeinu and Mashiach himself, which Mashiach has the same job to do as Eliyahu Hanavi. So Moshe Rabbeinu got the job started. Moses started the job and Eliyahu Hanavi finished the job, which we're going to understand. This is an important piece in this puzzle. So we said that Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, started the process to the era of Mashiach. Now, in, in numerology, in, in, in Torah, every letter has a numerical value. Every letter has energy. And we're going to see something very interesting in 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 gematria mashiach 
is known by many names. One of the names that Mashiach is known by is Shiloh. As if you look in text 13 in Bereshis, um, it says, Lo yosu shevet mi Yehuda, machokek mi ben raglov. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the student of the law from between his feet until Shiloh comes and until Shiloh comes and to him will be gathered, will be a gathering of peoples, right? So we're talking about Mashiach here with the name of Shiloh. Now Shiloh and Moshe have the same numerical value. They both equal up to 300 and 45. Yavo Shiloh, which means Shiloh comes, has the same numerical value as Mashiach. And this alludes to the idea that the Messianic era is all about bringing Moshe Rabbeinu's life work to fruition. He took us out of Egypt to bring us to Har Sinai, to receive the Torah, Vaya Abduni, as Hashem said, so that they may serve me. That's why we left Egypt, to receive the Torah and to serve Hashem. Now, um, now we can understand the questions that we asked earlier about the role of Eliyahu and Moshe Rabbeinu vis-a-vis -vis bringing the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt and the future redemption. So when Hashem came to Moshe Rabbeinu and told him to take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim and he's going to bring them to Eretz Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu understood really what was at stake. Taking, taking the world towards perfection, right? That we would be receiving the Torah and we would be going to that next level. With that in mind, Moshe Rabbeinu had a suggestion. <laughs> it was vetoed, as we know, but his suggestion was, let Eliyahu Hanavi do it. Eliyahu is synonymous with Mashiach. Let's get the job done. So here, Moshe Rabbeinu, he would be the one to bring us to get the Torah. And then Eliyahu Anavi would usher us in to the era of Mashiach. But the giving of the Torah was only to be one step towards the ultimate goal. It was a, a, a small time of, uh, of victory and, and, and it packed a great punch that still remains with us. We still have this. And that's why the prophet tells us every single Jew is going to be taken one at a time into the era of Mashiach. No Jew will be left behind. But it wasn't the ultimate. It was, it was a stepping stone. There was still to come. We saw there was a Yerida afterwards. There was a descent for the sake of an ascent. Moshe Rabbeinu essentially wanted to skip the middle part of the journey. He said, if the world is destined for perfection, let's just do it. Let's just get to it and Hashem answered that even though it sounds like a great idea it's not as simple as that it's really not as simple as that we needed the golos we needed the ureda we needed that descent in order so that ultimately it would transform the world and change the world and be able to take us to that place of everlasting transformation. And the Rebbe says in text number 14, Moses' primary accomplishment was the events at Matan Torah, and he thereby empowered future generations to work on transforming the world. Mashiach's mission is to complete that transformation. 
and bring about a time when all work will be in an environment of a perfect world. This then is the significance of God's response to Moses. I didn't say go and deliver the message to the Jewish people. Rather, go and deliver the message to Pharaoh. As for the person of whom you speak, I indeed plan on sending him in the future to the Jewish people. Moses was about working in a world that has a Pharaoh, working hard to transform and refine it. By contrast, Elijah and Mashiach are primarily conditioned to operate in a world in which the spirit of evil has been removed from the earth. So we are in an imperfect world. And every time we overcome evil, we weaken it. Every time we bring more light into the world, we flood the world with light that pushes away darkness right? We say a little light pushes away much darkness, one step at a time. And we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years already. As we say in Hebrew, it's already time. If you were feeling down upon yourself that you're not perfect, don't. That imperfection is a gift that Hashem has given to us. We are in an imperfect world that we slowly are bringing perfection to this world. If we find that we've slipped and we've fallen, we should remember that within that mistake, within that descent, Hashem has implanted the ability to ascend to an even greater place than we were before that descent. And that's our life's journey. And hopefully that journey is coming to a very uh, uh, um, quick end with the coming of Mashiach. It should be speedily in our days and we should merit to be embraced in the beauty of perfection in the light of God when at that time the whole world will be filled with light and love and and everything that is good. I want to wish everybody a beautiful week, a Shabbat Shalom.